And joining us now, Mr. Lee Donghui. He is a professor at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and National Security for the South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Very happy to welcome you to TVO and to Canada for that much. matter. Mm -hmm. I want to start, before we get into the economy of South Korea, I want to start with your name. Okay. In your country, you say your last name first. Yes. Why right. is that? Oh, because uh, in Oriental societies, family counts more than individuals. So last name counts more. So it's, mm -hmm. it's Lee, which is your family name, <coughs> Dong Hui. Yes. And Dong Hui means what? Oh, each each uh, character has its own meaning. Dong means east, and Hui means shining. So supposed to be shining in the east, but I'm not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very appropriate okay. for someone from the Republic of Korea Thanks. to be from the Shining East and be named <laughs> the Shining anyway. East. Okay, mm -hmm. we've got that figured out. Let's do a little history <coughs> lesson for starters. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of younger viewers on this mm -hmm. program who may not know the history. From 1950 to 53, of course, uh, Korea was in the midst of a terrible war. It ended in stalemate. You have the communist yes, right. North Korea. Mm -hmm. You have the democratic South Korea. Can you talk to us about what the state of South Korea's economy was like in the 1950s after that war. Okay, uh, during the 1950s, South Korean economy was totally devastated. When I was a young kid, I was uh, given a ration such as uh, milk powders and cornflakes, all these things, contribution from the United States to save the lives in the South Korea. Hmm. I was given myself. But during the last 50 years, Korean economy has achieved remarkable progress in advance. And now we are one of the uh, advanced countries. We are becoming one. Well, in fact, we have a chart yeah. to show that very thing. Here's GDP per capita yeah. as of the year 2008. And Canada's up there at nearly $40,000 per capita. Japan at 34,000 plus. And there's South Korea, 27.7. Mm -hmm. China well down the list at 6,000, but of course growing large every year, and North Korea, an abysmal $1,800 a year. Let's get into how your country went from a devastated economy mm -hmm. in the 1950s mm -hmm. to one of the real tigers of the economy today. How did you do it? Well, there are many reasons, or there are many uh, backgrounds. The first one is international society's help during the 1950s and 60s, right after the Korean War, was quite helpful to establish uh, foundations for economic progress. But after that, Korean government, at the same time, many well-educated Korean people were very much industrious. And we have a nice plan, economic plan. So we achieved some kind of progress in economic development. And also our export-oriented policy worked well, very well, so our income through export gets a very quantum jump. What are the key the sectors for you? Oh, right now, we, we are actually exporting everything from shipbuilding, ships, semiconductors, and cellular phones, automobiles you are familiar with. Cars we Canada, know, yes, we sure know that. And many TVs, LCD flat TVs. So everything, you name it. You're in it. You are selling them. <laughs> well, we know a lot about, uh, we mm -hmm. know, I guess, a little bit more about um, your country as it mm. relates to the environment because mm. of course the government of Ontario recently signed a a very large deal a multi-billion oh, yes. dollar mm. deal with, mm. uh, with yes. a consortium mm. led by Samsung mm -hmm. to provide solar and wind power for the province uh, South Korea did another deal worth 40 billion dollars yes. uh, to provide similar power for nuclear in this case yes. uh, reactors for the United mm. Arab Emirates That's right. what is the significance of these deals to the Republic of Korea well uh, our export of our nuclear reactors to Dubai in uh, United Arab Emirates will be the start of the process where Korean economy will get another quantum jump. Uh, following the United uh, Arab Emirates, Turkey and Jordan and other countries are looking for new nuclear reactors. And especially when energy crisis in terms of uh, oil supply is getting scarce and also climate change things will have uh, lots of uh, hindrance for the uh, fiss uh, fissile um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, energy. Yes. So there is a bright point for the nuclear energy generations. So uh, next strategic item for Korean export will be uh, nuclear reactors. So in that sense, the Dubai deal will mark the first or the beginning of the uh, long 
successful process for Korean industries. Let's talk now about the world stage mm -hmm. and Korea on the world stage, South Korea. For years now, this is from Newsweek, for years now, South Korea has been known internationally for its blazing economy, mm -hmm. but not much else. President Lee Myung-bak plans to use the economic crisis to change that. As China rises and the U.S. stagnates, Lee aims to exploit the gap between them in the process transforming South Korea from a self-involved Asian tiger into a respected global power that can mediate between rich and poor nations. What is South Korea doing to turn itself into this global okay. power? Well, I have to say first uh, three points. Korea has transformed itself uh, during the last 50 years. Number one, first aid recipient toward aid giver. Yes. Second, developing country toward moving toward developed status. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, we were kind of peace problem ourselves, but now we are doing peacemakers role. So all three, uh, against the backdrop of all three uh, uh, developments, Korea is now assuming the role of rule maker, one of the rule makers, instead of simply rule taker. Why do they feel that they are able to take that step at this point in their history? Well, uh, economic progress, at the same time, uh, democratization, all these things gave us lots of confidence. During the, our uh, last 20, 30 years, we have very good opportunities to reconvince ourselves. Mm -hmm. The first one is Olympic Games in 1988 in Seoul. The second one is uh, World Cup in 2002. 2002. Yes, remember that. And the third is coming. That's the G20 summit meeting in mm -hmm. this November. So every great occasions like these, Korean people can have a kind of rechecking point where how far we have come and how much tasks lie ahead, all these things can be rechecked and we can, you know, reaffirm our confidence. We have a G20 coming up in this country mm -hmm. as well and mm -hmm. frankly most of the coverage so far mm -hmm. has focused on how irritated the locals are going to be at mm -hmm. all of these diplomats mm -hmm. from around the world coming in. Uh, Koreans don't see it that way. No, not at all. Korea sees it as a very good opportunity to project ourselves to the, at the global level, as you uh, already told. Korea is very proud and very confident, and G10 will be the kind of momentum to show around and to reassure ourselves that Korea is doing the right thing and we will do more things at the global level. Let me quote. So we uh, welcome it. You welcome it. Mm -hmm. Let me quote one more uh, item from that Newsweek mm -hmm. article. Last year, it officially became the first former recipient of international aid to graduate to the donor ranks, sending $1 billion to poor countries. It plans to triple that sum within five years. Likewise, it will more than double its deployment of peacekeeping troops mm -hmm. to 10 global hotspots, including Pakistan. So again, why are South Koreans now apparently willing to pay mm -hmm. the financial costs of being a world player? Well, uh, there are, I think there are, I can think of two reasons. The first one is Korea has been a recipient. We were helped by the international society. So if we have certain capacity being developed, then we have to help in return. That is the first reason. Second reason is Korea is a divided country. We will do a great job of reunification process in the future to come. In that case, we will need lots of international society's understanding and help. So through our contribution to international mm -hmm. society, we will expect same understandings and contrib contributions from the world society in the future to come. Uh, Professor Lee, I do want to get to the whole reunification issue, but first, before we go there, I want to talk about China. Okay. What is the status of Chinese-South Korean relations today? Mm -hmm. uh, in economic uh, terms, China is the number one trading company, uh, trading uh, state of Korea. Since year the 2003, China has been the number one trading partner, number one investment target, and number one, let's say, people's exchanges. So, in economic terms, China is the most, one of the most important countries in the world. Does South Just Korea not have a problem with the fact that it's an authoritarian communist regime? Mm, as far as the economy is concerned, there is no problem. 
<laughs> <laughs> that's very okay. That's very realistic. Uh, uh -huh. Looking at it very realistically, and just followed by the United States and Japan. So mm -hmm. we are; those are the uh, big three trading uh, partners of Korea. Right. What mm -hmm. role does South Korea want to play in in Asia in terms of geopolitics? Okay, so far uh, for the last fifty years, we have been paying lots of attention to the Korean Peninsula, peacekeeping, and all these things. But we have to broaden our perspectives toward more regional things, at the same time to global things. So for the regional uh, perspective, we have to keep good relations with China and Japan. Mm -hmm. those, were the those are the surrounding countries. And further than that, we have to have a good relationship with the Southeast Asian countries, like ASEAN countries, mm -hmm. and also with India, who is uh, emerging very rapidly in the political and economic scene at the global level. So those are called Korea's uh, diplomatic initiative called New Asian Initiative. New Asian Initiative. New Asian Initiative. So our uh, diplomacy has three levels. The first, first level is US-Korea relations alliance, military alliance. That is a bottom line and anchor. Mm -hmm. Second part is New Asian Initiative, dealing with good relationship with uh, many countries in Asia. The third level is global. That means we have to do more active G20 kind of leadership role. At the same time, we have to make more contributions to peacekeeping at the same time, developmental aid. I understand. Mm -hmm. Let's finish up then on reunification. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, you are still in a state of war with North Korea, right? Yes. And have mm -hmm. been ever since 1953, mm -hmm. technically there speaking. There has been a truce, not yes. a peace, peace uh, treaty. Right. Mm -hmm. What, this goes back and forth. I know some governments have a particularly mm -hmm. uh, aggressive bellicose mm -hmm. attitude towards the North. Others try more of a rapprochement. Right. Where do you think things are today? Well, things are very complicated right now because North Korea has been trying to develop nuclear arsenals. Mm -hmm. And that is the uh, number one uh, concern between United States and North Korea and at the same time international society. As you know, non-proliferation is the kind of key word for world peace and stabilities, but North Korea is going against that tide. So it's a very complicated, very difficult uh, situation here we are uh, looking at. Do you think this is trending ultimately towards another military showdown in order to get North Korea to do what the rest of the uh, world wants? Personally, I don't think so, and I, I, don't, uh, I hope not. Mm -hmm. Um, it will be, it should be resolved peacefully by the uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations. They have been trying for a long yes, time to get that. Yes, still we are trying. Uh, any progress? Doesn't seem to be. Mm. You've got the United States, you've got China, you've got lots of countries involved. Mm. It's Six a very, uh, it should be a very long and winding road. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult, but it is the task uh, to be achieved. Mm -hmm. What do you see happening if the dear leader, as they call him, mm -hmm. Kim Jong-il, what happens if he dies? Play it out for us. What oh, I have to be very cautious, but uh, I think after his death, possible, uh, in, possibly in, within five to ten years, I think there will be a kind of succession problem. This case is quite different from the previous case, where his father, Kim Il-sung, died, mm -hmm. Kim Jong-il took over the power. But third generation succession is a very difficult political sense. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I guess that there will be kind of collective leadership, or you, can, you may call it military junta-like mm -hmm. collective leadership structure, even though some son, one son of uh, Kim Jong-il will be a figurehead. But actual decision making could be made by the, uh, within a collective uh, decision-making process. Does that enhance the chances of reunification? It could go both ways. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, do they? No. Hmm? It's a big mystery, that country still, isn't it? Sure. But now, until now, Kim Jong-il seems to be in a very uh, good grip of controlling. Do, do people in South Korea wish for his death? No. I won't. I cannot say we wish. It will come naturally. Yeah, but do, do the chances for peace get enhanced if he's out of the way? You know, I mean, the rest of the world oh, sees, him, oh, as, sees that, him as a crazy That's your man. point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a both sides. 
he is in firm control right now. So he could be the man with whom we can talk. If he were not there and there is a chaos, that could be more risk, more dangerous. Hmm. So you got to watch what you wish for. Right. Understood. Mm -hmm. Professor Lee Donghui, mm -hmm. we thank you for being the uh, shining east in our studio today. <laughs> I thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, very meaningful uh, TV show. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.